Challenging the colonial world is not a rational confrontation of viewpoints. It is not a discourse on the universal, but the impassioned claim by the colonized that their world is fundamentally different. The colonial world is a Manichaean world. The colonist is not content with physically limiting the space of the colonized, i.e. with the help of his agents of law and order. As if to illustrate the totalitarian nature of colonial exploitation, the colonist turns the colonized into a kind of quintessence of evil. Footer 1. We have demonstrated in black skin, white masks, the mechanism of this Manichaean world. End of footnote. Colonized society is not merely portrayed as a society without values. The colonist is not content with stating that the colonized world has lost its values or worse, never possessed any. The native is declared impervious to ethics, representing not only the absence of values, but also the negation of values. He is, dare we say it, the enemy of values. In other words, absolute evil. A corrosive element destroying everything within his reach, a corrupting element distorting everything which involves aesthetics or morals, an agent of malevolent powers, an unconscious and incurable instrument of blind forces. And Monsieur Meyer could say in all seriousness in the French National Assembly, that we should not let the Republic be defiled by the penetration of the Algerian people. Values are, in fact, irreversibly poisoned and infected as soon as they come into contact with the colonized. The customs of the colonized, their traditions, their myths, especially their myths, are the very mark of this indigence and innate depravity. This is why we should place DDT which destroys parasites, carriers of disease, on the same level as Christianity, which roots out heresy, natural impulses, and evil. The decline of yellow fever and the advances made by evangelizing form part of the same balance sheet. But triumphant reports by the missions in fact tell us how deep the seeds of alienation have been sown among the colonized. I am talking of Christianity, and this should come as no su surprise to anyone. The church in the colonies is a white man's church, a foreigner's church. It does not call the colonized to the ways of God, but to the ways of the white man, to the ways of the master, the ways of the oppressor. And as we know in this story, many are called, but few are chosen. Sometimes this Manichaeism reaches its logical conclusion and dehumanizes the colonized subject. In plain talk, he is reduced to the state of an animal. And consequently, when the colonist speaks of the colonized, he uses zoological terms. Allusion is made to the slithery movements of the yellow race, the odors from the native quarters, to the hordes, the stink, the swarming, the seething, and the gesticulations. In his endeavors at description and finding the right word, the colonist refers constantly to the bestiary. The European seldom has a problem with figures of speech, but the colonized who immediately grasp the intention of the colonist and the exact case being made against them know instantly what he is thinking. This explosive population growth, those hysterical masses, those blank faces, those shapeless, obese bodies, this headless, tailless cohort, these children who do, do not seem to belong to anyone, this indolence sprawling under the sun, this vegetating existence, all this is part of the colonial vocabulary. General de Gaulle speaks of yellow multitudes, and Monsieur Marillac of the black, brown, and yellow hordes that will soon invade our shores. The colonized know all that all that and roar with laughter every time they hear themselves called an animal by the other, for they know that they are not animals. And at the very moment when they discover their humanity, they begin to sharpen their weapons to secure its victory. 
As soon as the colonized begin to strain at the leash and to pose a threat to the colonist, they are assigned a series of good souls who in the symposiums on culture spell out the specificity and richness of Western values. But every time the issue of Western values crops up, the colonized grow tense and their muscles seize up. During the period of decolonization, the colonized are called upon to be reasonable. They are offered rock-solid values. They are told in great detail that decolonization should not mean regression, and that they must rely on values which have proved to be reliable and worthwhile. Now it so happens that when the colonized hear speech on Western culture, they draw their machetes or at least check to see they are close at hand. The supremacy of white values is stated with such violence, the victorious confrontation of these values with the lifestyle and beliefs of the colonized is so impregnated with aggressiveness that as a countermeasure, the colonized rightly make a mockery of them whenever they are mentioned. In the col colonial context, the colonist only quits undermining the colonized once the latter have proclaimed loud and clear that white values reign supreme. In the period of decolonization, the colonized masses thumb their noses at these very values, shower them with insults, and vomit them up. Such an occurrence normally goes unseen because during decolonization, certain colonized intellectuals have established a dialogue with the bourgeois of the colonizing country. During this period, the indigenous population is seen as a blurred mass. The few native personalities whom the colonists, colon, colonialist bourgeois have chance to encounter have had insufficient impact to alter their current perception and nuance their thinking. During the period of liberation, however, the colonialist bourgeoisie fr frantically seeks contact with the colonized elite. It is with this elite that the famous dialogue on values is established. When the colonialist bourgeoisie realizes it is impossible to maintain its domination over the colonies, it decides to wage a re-argued campaign in the fields of culture, values, and technology, etc. But what we should never forget is that the immense majority of colonized peoples are impervious to such issues. For a colonized people, the most essential value, because it is the most meaningful, is first and foremost the land. The land which must provide bread and, naturally, dignity. But this dignity has nothing to do with human dignity. The colonized subject has never heard of such an ideal. All he has ever seen on his land is that he can be arrested, beaten, and starved with impunity. And no sermonizer on morals, no priest, has ever stepped in to bear the blows in his place or share his bread. For the colonized, to be a moralist quite plainly means silencing the arrogance of the colonist, breaking his spiral of violence, in a word, ejecting him outright from the picture. The famous dictum which states that all men are equal will find its illustration in the colonies only when the colonized subject states that he is equal to the colonist. Taking it a step further, he is determined to fight to be more than the colonist. In fact, he has already decided to take his place. As we have seen, it is the collapse of an entire moral and material universe. The intellectual who, for his part, has adopted the abstract universal values of the colonizer, is prepared to fight so that the colonist and colonized can live in peace in a new world. But what he does not see, precisely because colonialism and all its modes of thought have seeped into him, is that the colonist is no longer interested in staying on and coexisting once the colonial context has disappeared. It is no coincidence that even before any negotiation between the Algerian government and the French government, the so-called liberal European minority has already made its position clear. It is clamoring for dual citizenship, nothing less. By sticking to the abstract, the colonist is being forced to make a very substantial leap into the unknown. Let us be honest, the colonist knows perfectly well that no jargon is a substitute for reality.
The colonized subject thus discovers that his life, his breathing, and his heartbeats are the same as the colonist. He discovers that the skin of a colonist is not worth more than the natives. In other words, his, word, his world receives a fundamental jolt. The colonized's revolutionary new assurances stem from this. If, in fact, my life is worth as much as the colonists, his look can no longer strike fear into me or nail me to the spot, and his voice can no longer petrify me. I am no longer uneasy in his presence. In reality, to hell with him. Not only does his presence no longer bother me, but I am already preparing to waylay him in such a way that soon he will have no other solution but to flee. The colonial context, as we have said, is characterized by the dichotomy it inflicts upon the world. Decolonization unifies this world by a radical decision to remove its heterogeneity. By unifying it, on the grounds of nation and sometimes race. To quote the biting words of Senegalese patriots on the maneuvers of their president Senghor, we asked for the Africanization of the top jobs and all Senghor does is Africanize the Europeans. Meaning that the colonized can see right away if decolonization is taking place or not. The minimum demand is that the last become the first. But the colonized intellectual introduces a variation on this demand, and in fact there seems to be no lack of motivation to fill senior positions as administrators, technicians, and experts. The colonized, however, equate this nepotism with acts of sabotage, and it is not unusual to hear them declare, what is the point of being independent then? Wherever an authentic liberation struggle has been fought, Wherever the blood of the people has been shed and the armed phase has lasted long enough to encourage the intellectuals to withdraw their rank and file base, there is an effective eradication of the superstructure borrowed by these intellectuals from the colonialist bourgeoisie circles. In its narcissistic monologue, the colonialist bourgeoisie, by way of its academics, had implanted in the minds of the colonized that the essential values, meaning Western values, remain eternal despite all errors attributable to man. The colonized intellectual accepted the cogency of these ideas and there in the back of his mind stood a sentinel on duty guarding the Greco-Roman pedestal. But during the struggle for liberation, when the colonized intellectual touches base again with his people, this artificial sentinel is smashed to smithereens. All of the Mediterranean values, the triumph of the individual of enlightenment and beauty turn into pale, lifeless trinkets. All of those discourses appear a jumble of dead words. Those values which seem to ennoble the soul prove worthless because they have nothing in common with the real life struggle in which the people are engaged. And first among them is individualism. The colonized intellectual learned from his masters that the individual must assert himself. The co colonialist bourgeoisie hammered into the colonized mind the notion of a society of individuals where each is locked in his subjectivity, where wealth lies in thought. But the colonized intellectual, who was lucky enough to bunker down with the people during the liberation struggle, will soon discover the falsity of this theory. Involvement in the organization of the struggle will already introduce him to a different vocabulary. Brother, sister, comrade are words outlawed by the colonialist bourgeoisie because in their thinking, my brother is a wallet and my comrade my scheming. In a kind of auto da fe, the colonized intellectual witnesses the destruction of all his idols. Egoism, arrogant recrimination, and the idiotic, childish need to have the last word. This colonized intellectual, pulverized by colonialist culture, will also discover the strength of the village assemblies, the power of the people's commissions, and the extraordinary productiveness of neighborhood and section committee meetings. Personal interests are now the collective interest, because in reality everyone will be discovered by the French legionnaires, and consequently massacred, or else everyone will be saved. 
In such a context, the every man for himself concept, the atheist's form of salvation, is prohibited. Self-criticism has been much talked about recently, but few realize that it was first of all an African institution. Whether it be in the Jemas of North Africa or the Palavers of West Africa, tradition has it that disputes which break out in a village are worked out in public. By this I mean collective self-criticism with a touch of humor because everyone is relaxed, because in the end we all want the same thing. The intellectual sheds all that calculating, all those strange silences, those ulterior motives, that devious thinking and secrecy as he gradually plunges deeper among the people. In this respect, then, we can genuinely say that the community has already triumphed and exudes its own light, its own reason. But when decolonization occurs in regions where the liberation struggle has not yet made its impact sufficiently felt, here the, smart, the same smart Alex, the sly, shrewd intellectuals, whose behavior and ways of thinking, picked up from their rubbing shoulders with the colonialist bourgeoisie, have remained intact. Spoiled children of yesterday's colonialism and today's governing powers, they oversee the looting of the few natural, national resources. Ruthless in their scheming and legal pilfering, they use the poverty, now nationwide, to work their way to the top through import-export holdings, limited companies, playing the stock market, and nepotism. They insist on the nationalization of business transactions, i.e. reserving contracts and business deals for nationals. Their doctrine is to proclaim the absolute need for nationalizing the theft of the nation. In this barren national phase, in this so-called period of austerity, their success at plundering the nation swiftly sparks anger and violence from the people. In the present international and African context, the poverty-stricken and independent population achieves a social consciousness at a rapidly accelerating pace. This, the petty individualists, will soon find out themselves. In order to assimilate the culture of the oppressor and venture into his fold, the colonized subject has had to pawn some of his own intellectual possessions. For instance, one of the things he has had to assimilate is the way the colonialist bourgeoisie thinks. This is apparent in the colonized intellectual's ineptitude to engage in dialogue, for he is unable to make himself inessential when confronted with a purpose or idea. On the other hand, when he operates among the people, he is constantly awestruck. He is literally disarmed by their good faith and integrity. He is then constantly at risk of becoming a demagogue. He turns into a kind of mimic man who nods his assent to every word by the people, transformed by him into an arbiter of truth. But the fella, the unemployed and the starving, do not lay claim to truth. They do not say they represent the truth because they are the truth in their very being. During this period, the intellectual behaves objectively like a vulgar opportunist. His maneuvering, in fact, is still at work. The people would never think of rejecting him or cutting the ground from under his feet. What the people want is for everything to be pulled together. The colonized intellectual's insertion into this human tide will find itself on hold because of his curious obsession with detail. It is not that the people are opposed to analysis. They appreciate clarification, understand the reasoning behind an argument, and like to see where they are going. But at the start of his cohabitation with the people, the colonized intellectual gives priority to detail and tends to forget the very purpose of the struggle, to defeat colonialism. Swept along by the many facets of the struggle, he tends to concentrate on local tasks, undertaken zealously but almost always too pedantically. He does not always see the overall picture. He introduces the notion of disciplines, specialized areas and fields into that awesome mi mixture and grinder called a people's revolution. Committed to certain frontline issues, he tends to lose sight of the unity of the movement, and in the event of failure at the local level, he succumbs to doubt, even despair. 
The people, on the other hand, take a global stance from the very start. Bread and land. How do we go about getting bread and land? And this stubborn, apparently limited, narrow-minded aspect of the people is finally the most rewarding and effective working model.